Definitely one of those transition era jets. Definitely. Straight wings, kind of bulbous. You know, traditional late 40s, early 50s. Hello everybody, I'm Dare Tevers. Welcome aboard, welcome to Whitby Island Naval Air Station and aboard our Douglas F-3D Sky Knight. I later designated the F-10 Sky Knight, a twin-engine, mid-wing, carrier-based, all-weather night fighter. Yeah. Never produced in great numbers, it did achieve many firsts in its role as a night fighter over Korea. Never achieved the fame of the North American F-86 Sabre, it did down several Soviet-based MiG-15s as a night fighter with only one air-to-air -air loss of its own against a Chinese MiG-15. Let's go ahead and uh, drop some flap. Yep. Let's power up our two Westinghouse J-34 WE-38 turbojets, 3,000 pounds of thrust each. I don't have my brakes on, I promise. Yeah, I noticed those rear wheels weren't moving. I was like, what? And I checked my brakes like four times. Nope, brakes were off. <clears throat> All right. The Sky Knight played an important role in the development of the radar-guided AIM-7 Sparrow, which led to further air-to-air -air missile developments. It also served as an electronic warfare platform in the Vietnam War as a precursor to the EA-6A Intruder and the EA-6B Prowler. This aircraft was not intended to be a typical sleek and nimble dogfighter, but it was designed as a standoff night fighter, packing a powerful radar system and a second crew member. It originated in 1945 with the United States Navy requirement for a jet-powered, pow radar-equipped, carrier-based night fighter. The result was an aircraft with a wide, deep, and roomy fuselage. Instead of ejection seats, an escape tunnel was used, similar to the type used on the A3 Sky Warrior. As a night fighter, it was not expected to be as fast as the smaller daytime fighters. The expectation was to have a stable platform for that ra that radar system and the four 20mm cannons mounted to the lower fuselage. The F-3D was, however, able to outturn a MiG-15 in an inside circle. Now, the fire control system for this aircraft was the Westinghouse AN-APQ-35. This was advanced for the time combination of three different radars, each performing separate functions, a search radar, a tracking radar, and a tail warning radar. The complexity of this vacuum tube-based radar system meant that it required extensive maintenance to keep it operating properly. Remember, vacuum tubes. These things are very easy to damage. Vibration is their enemy. It's on a jet aircraft that's landing on a carrier. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of maintenance involved in that. There wasn't a lot about this aircraft. This aircraft served its role. It's kind of a developmental aircraft. It was designed during a time period where we were just thinking about transitioning from guns to missiles. It wasn't flashy, but it did its job. That was, you know, sort of the important thing. The crew of two, a top speed of 495 knots, that's 565 miles per hour or 909 kilometers an hour at 20,000 feet, 6,095 meters. Range was about 1,000 nautical miles, depending on the configuration and whether it was carrying any drop tanks. Along with those four 20mm Hispano Suiza M2 cannons, she could carry two uh, 11.75 inch Tiny Tim rocket packs, four Sparrow 1 air to air missiles, the, um, at least if it was the 2M model, and two 2,000 pound bombs. I'm flying this way because I figure that's how I circle back around. Yay! I do. 
All right, the interior of this aircraft is impressive. Look at that, there's the radar scope for my, my Rhino. This is an Alpha aircraft, so we expect high detail out of them. And it is very nice looking. It's not fast, it's not flashy, but it's not supposed to be. It's designed to do its job and do its job well, and that's about it. I'm gonna try to put it on the deck though, properly, sort of. All right, shift one. There's our gauges up close and personal. They look ugly like that. Two, there is our autopilot. Nav. GPS, generators, fuel cutoff, all of that, and that's it. Let's go for the outside really quick. I want to see, where's the air brakes? Ah, tail brakes. That's pretty normal for this era of aircraft. Sink rate. Yeah, I know. Sink rate. I'm well aware of this. Pull where is up. my speed exactly? Ah, there Pull it is. Up. I'm trying to sink that fast. Thank you. All right, good. Pull up. Oh, stop it. Pull up. Back, here we go. And now, should be able to glide her in. Clear those trees nicely. the The positioning of the uh, canopy supports is a little makes this a little bit tricky. Uh, you kind of kind of have to look past your windshield wiper and hope. Oh yeah. Look at that. Look at that. Did I? I hit nearly center line. Oh my good gravy. Look at that. Beautiful. There's even a checklist. Look at this, guys. There's even a checklist. I think you can even read it. Yep, you can even read it. Be quiet. <laughs> All right, let's open up the cockpit. Let's see what opens. Ah, look at that. Out through the roof. That's nice and fun. I cannot imagine that would be a fun or easy thing to do. But there you go. That is the Douglas F3D Sky Knight. Nice looking aircraft. Definitely something to take a look at if you're looking for that kind of late 40s, early 50s. It also, because it's straight wing, is going to have a much more benign behavior as it approaches its stall speeds than a swept wing aircraft. So it'd be good as a, like a transition aircraft for Gibbons like me. All right, the link is in the description, as always. I've been Derek Tabbers. This has been your Flight Simulator X Plane Spotlight, the Douglas F3D Sky Knight. And it's even in 3D. Ha-ha, ba-dum-tish.